Hello, Black Hollywood Live fans. Today we are talking racist police department text, a $100 million Uber settlement, and a man who faces life imprisonment over candy bars. All that and more on today's Justice is Served. You are tuned in to Black Hollywood Live's Justice is Served. Hello and welcome to Black Hollywood Live's Justice is Served, where we talk the latest legal news every week. My name is Shaka Smith. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Shaka Strong, and I'm joined here by my co-host, Shannon Myricks. And you can find me at Shannon Myricks on Twitter.com. So, wow, Shannon, we have a lot of, uh, some varied cases today to talk about. Interesting stuff today. But the, probably one of the most disturbing things is uh, these racist texts that they found in San Francisco in the police department there. Officer Jason Lay, um, during an investigation, um, they found that he had sent several racist texts that referenced Mexicans, um, black people, poor people in general. Um, how did we get here? So, once again, we have double deja vu here. We have an officer who's accused of sexual assault of a woman. There is an investigation in progress. They obtain, in that probe, they obtain text messages from Officer Lau's personal phone. Uh, some of the text messages included, I hate that beaner, uh, but I think the nig is worse. Indian people are disgusting, burn down Walgreens and kill the bums. So anyone who's ever visited San Francisco or lives in San Francisco knows that there is a large population of homeless people in the city. Uh, but once again, we have an officer making disparaging remarks about minority and disenfranchised communities. Why does this matter? Because when we think about officers and how they have to carry out the law, we want to make sure there's no animus in their policing. Yeah. So if an officer is arresting an African American on suspicion of theft, for instance, we want to make sure that his racist attitudes don't play a role in that arrest, as opposed to um, arresting a white person who is accused of theft. And, and we will say that the officer resigned a few weeks ago, but he's a six-year veteran, so he's been there for quite some time. And his, his attorney, Don Noble, he said the texts were not reflective of who the officer is and that he did not display the sentiments during his work. Well, what did you think about that, that comment? I think that that's, that's ridiculous. Uh, he said something about there is context. He's like, I can't imagine in any context where that language would be acceptable, yeah. but there is context. And I'm like, in no context is it going to be appropriate to make comments such as uh, two African Americans were involved in a shooting, they went to a hospital, they all survived, and he said, too bad none of them died, then I wouldn't have to worry about them anymore. Uh, I think that's context, and the context yeah. is that he is very racist and inappropriate. It's reprehensible, and one of the texts even referenced the community, and he said the community, they were all drug dealers. And we have this problem of viewing communities in certain ways, and our actions uh, inform the are, are brought about by how we what we believe that we're facing. Mm -hmm. And so it was very disturbing to, to hear that. And we know that we had the Mario Woods case there, um, where this guy was shot 20 times. Yes, he was wielding a knife, but this guy was shot 20 times by a team of officers. And it says, what, what are they viewing the community they're serving as? Well, if we use officer lies text messages as any indication, they're all drug dealers and they're better off dead. So it makes it a lot easier to enter a tricky situation where a suspect is holding a, a knife and then just shoot him 20 times yeah. and move on and, and never think twice. And I think it's just, it's all the more disturbing because a year ago, another investigation revealed over a dozen officers sending these racist texts. And it, I don't know what the solution is. I believe the chief, um, the chief police guy there, um, Greg Sir, has said he's going to give them some bias training. But will that be enough by the end of the year to give them bias training? Bias training is not enough. I think you have to change the attitudes of the people that you're hiring. And sometimes in changing that attitude, there should be a screening for bias when officers are hired onto the force. It's not just we experienced this training and now we're all better. Uh, racial bias is so deeply ingrained in a person's psyche that sometimes they don't even know. So we don't even know how uh, racial bias operates in our day-to-day -day life, in our decision-making. And you would think the police department to be a little bit more vigilant about those they employ. To a certain extent. I think now they're starting to have to wake up a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, at least they're getting some bias training. Hopefully it'll open up a broader conversation um, into what's going on, at least in San Francisco and hopefully across the country. 
Well, we had uh, another very interesting case where a judge upheld uh, the North Carolina voter law. Um, this law was quite controversial, as you know, because it required photo IDs, and people thought this would disproportionately affect minorities. Uh, what did you think of the argument in uh, the judge upholding that law? I think the judge did not consider the fact that many minorities, specifically in North Carolina, are African American or even Latino, typically move more often. So to require them to have to register again is, is already onerous in and of itself. They cut down the early voting by seven days, so yeah. people who work demanding jobs, typically those who are low wage, who don't have the opportunity to just walk away from their cashier job or their construction job to go vote in the middle of the day, they've lost seven more days to vote. Yeah, and what you referenced earlier I forgot to mention was that if you moved to a different county, you have to re-register. Certainly. Yeah. That's a huge problem. Yeah. If For our listeners or viewers in California, a lot of folks work in LA County but live in Orange County or even live in San Bernardino County. So most of your working day is spent in LA County, so typically you're gonna decide, okay, I'll vote here because it's convenient to my job and I won't spend as much time away. Well, and if you apply that to North Carolina, your vote would not count. If you vote outside of your county, they've now decided that that vote will not be counted. Yeah, it, it's, it's disturbing, and so the NAACP, um they're really trying to overturn overturn this and really turn a, a light to what's happening in North Carolina. Um, what do you think their chances are of going further with this? I think it's going to be very important to show the data. Mm -hmm. The judge and the other side cannot dispute. If we have data that shows that the majority of African Americans and Latinos frequently, frequently move, the majority of African Americans and Latinos frequently take advantage of the early voting days and cutting them down uh, makes it more difficult for them to vote. And last but not least, to show that, you know, folks from different, folks work in different counties but live in another county would be prevented from voting or would have it much more difficult to vote um, in a time manner because of the new law. So I think that's what the NAACP has to work on, and I don't doubt that they'll, they'll locate that data. Yeah, because we, we do need to show it has a disparate a impact, and so I think uh, I think that'll be very important in uh, getting this law returned. And, you know, North Carolina, no stranger to controversy, uh, they had the bathroom law, and that's been stirring up a lot of trouble um, for the state. And recently, we had a transgender student in South Carolina um, get followed into the bathroom and out of Oakland, we have our own Transgender Law Center working on his behalf. Could you tell us more about that? Yes, the Transgender Law Center out of Oakland, California, big up to the Bay Area, <laughs> has wrote a letter to the school board where the student was disciplined saying that they need to apologize to the student, they need to wipe his one-day suspension from his record, and they need to allow all students to use restrooms based on the gender that they identify with. And if they don't comply, um, they're saying they may file suit, but they may go to the Department of Education to enforce Title IX. And as we know, Title IX um, revolves around sex discrimination. And this has a little bit more teeth because the Fourth Circuit in uh, Gavin Grimm versus the Gloucester County School Board found that they violated his, his rights um, when he went um, to the bathroom. So how, th how might this affect the North Carolina bathroom law? This would certainly have an effect. This is the first test of the Fourth Circuit appeals decision. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, based on that decision, the North Carolina, North Carolina law is not constitutional under Title IX because the ruling said that individuals should be allowed to use whatever bathroom that they identify with as it pertains to gender. The North Carolina law that prevents individuals from using public restrooms um, that don't gel with the gender that they were assigned when they were born, or even allowing people to accost people who don't look gender conforming, i.e. a woman going into a bathroom with short hair and maybe really baggy clothes on that day, could be stopped and asked to verify her gender. So uh, this first challenge is definitely going to test that Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, and I definitely think it's going to cause problems for the North Carolina law. Yeah, absolutely, because yeah. um, for our viewers or listeners who don't know, that decision by the Fourth Circuit is going to be binding in Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. I mean, it, you would think in this day and age that we'd kind of move past you know, this sort of level of discrimination, but... 
I think being from California and not experiencing the South, the South really dances and drums to its own beat, and it's much slower than yeah. the West Coast. <laughs> Apparently. So hopefully um, at least the Transgender Law Center is doing some great work. So hopefully, yeah, they will uh, advocate strongly for that uh, student. And so now on to a, another big one, Uber and this $100 million settlement. And it sounds like a big number, but it really isn't such a, a big number. So at issue in this case is whether or not their drivers are employees or independent contractors. And you know, Uber gets to save a lot. They save about $4.1 billion a year classifying their drivers as independent contractors. They pay no minimum wage. They don't have to worry about payroll taxes, no workers' compensation, and they don't have to do any driver reimbursement for the cost of driving. Uh, so what did you think about this $100 million settlement? You know, I'm a law student, so math is not my strong suit. But in looking at $100 million versus $4.1 billion saved, that's really a drop in the bucket. That's the equivalent of having $4 and losing one cent, or maybe even less than one cent, if that helps put it in perspective. So really, I would say Uber's not hurting too bad off of this. And really, what, nothing's been decided. So Uber is allowed to continue to operate as if, you know, all their drivers are independent contractors. Yeah, because this was a settlement. So at least in California and Massachusetts, um, the drivers, they, they've set aside $84 million to compensate drivers. But there was no decision as to whether or not these were employees or independent contractors. Those drivers will remain independent contractors, but there was no decision setting that out as it was a settlement. And so they face suits right now in several states, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Florida, New York. What do you think is going to be the outcome when we look at the, the different requirements for an employee? So specific to California, um, there's a rebuttable presumption that a worker is an employee. Now, defendants can rebut that presumption by proving a certain group of factors. So in Uber's case, they have to look at the factors that include uh, whether a worker has the right to control and the discretion as to the manner of in performance of the contract. So breaking that down into this issue specifically, Uber is going to want to prove that their drivers have full control. They get to determine when they work. They get to determine how much they work. They, for the most part, get to determine what sort of vehicle they use you know within state you know state standards and within uber standards um, and they're gonna try to they're gonna try to play on that factor really heavily they're gonna rely on that big time on the other side people are gonna say well uber controls their prices they set the prices anyone who's ever ridden with uber especially in West Hollywood knows about the surge uh, that's all base that's all done by uber drivers have no control over that so I think it's I, I think this is gonna be a, a close one a real close one and I think Uber is definitely going to try to delay yeah. having any sort of trial on this sort of issue. And I think we see, I, I foresee more settlements in the future, especially as it pertains to those other six states. Yeah, and, and one of the issues was Uber's deactivation policy. They were de deactivating drivers with no warning or um, explanation. And so that kind of leads more to the fact that you're an employer, you know. Mm -hmm. And what they've done in California and in, the, in um, Massachusetts in the settlement is they're going to start to create essentially what's a driver's association or a driver's union. And uh, they will no longer be deactivating drivers for no reason. They'll give them cause and they may even get, uh, an, there may even be an appeals process to that. So it looks as if the drivers will start to get treated a little bit better. But I, I think when you start to classify drivers as employees, it, you then have to service the drivers as employees. And I think they're really avoiding it to pay, to pay out the extra money to treat the drivers well. Yeah, so there's that $4.1 billion saved, and there's also the unforeseen costs associated with liability. Um, many passengers with Uber and other rideshare services have had incidents of sexual assault and violence against them. And by making sure the drivers stay as independent contractors, Uber is not liable for their actions. So that that's a factor, and that, I think, is most relevant to our viewers here, as I'm sure a lot of them are riders. They have to think about the fact that, you know, if Uber can just just walk away from any incident that happens to you and likely your driver is probably judgment proof you'll be left holding the bag with whatever medical cost or emotional trauma associated with an ordeal that you have involving Uber. And, and certainly if they were liable they would probably take extra steps to make sure the drivers were safer, the conditions were as safe as possible, everybody was vetted even more thoroughly. Certainly preventative care would be 
absolute. Uh, one thing that Uber is resisting right now is fingerprinting. Fingerprinting would yeah. certainly uh, provide a lot more safety. It's something that teachers have to experience. Government employees have to be fingerprinted. Why not people who are driving two tons of metal at up to at speeds of up to 80 miles per hour? And, and two people that are strangers to one another. And so you really want that process to have a driver to be someone who is at least as safe as possible, you know, background checked to a certain degree. Right. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. It, you know, it's a big business. They're what valued at sixty-two billion dollars. So hopefully, they can be a leader in the industry and uh, um, service people a little bit better. And you know, this last one was you know a little confounding for me. Uh, a Louisiana man. Um, well, he stole thirty-one dollars of candy bars. So I mean, it, it wasn't just a ah, candy bar. So, but you know. It, not significant enough to warrant 20 years, and now he faces 20 years to life because of the of Habitual Offender Program. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this? So the Habitual Offender Program is Louisiana's sort of version of the three strikes law that we have in California. And basically the point of these sort of laws came under the enhancement statutes that became really popular in the 80s and 90s because there was a spike in crime. Some say that spike was due to, you know, widespread drug abuse in disenfranchised communities. Nonetheless, we have these laws that make sure people who habitually commit crimes one, two, or three times face harsher and harsher sentences. The hope there is that they'd be deterred from committing those crimes. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's surprising to me that this hasn't been rolled back already. You know, it's already kind of an issue in our presidential election. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here we see people that are actually suffering from the weight of this. This guy has a ninth grade education. He does have five, five prior theft convictions. But the concern is people taking plea deals now in order to av avoid these mandatory minimums. And so you may not have done the crime, but now you're incentivized to say, look, I'll take the plea deal for 10 years and avoid the 40-year sentence. Right. And yeah, could you tell us why that's so dangerous? So an example, a real-life example, is a man was accused of carjacking someone. He knew he didn't do it. He affirmed that he didn't do it the whole time. His public defender sat down with him and said, look, you have a prior record. You have burglary. You have drug charges. It is not in your interest to go to trial, because if you go to trial and you lose, that's 40 years mandatory sentence. You'd be better off pleading guilty and getting only 10 years. So what did that man do? He pled guilty to not risk, you know, a jury trial deciding that he had done it. Fast forward, they found evidence that he had not committed the crime, but it was too late because he had already pled guilty. And so, so normally we think you find evidence he didn't commit the crime, new trial, or at least try to go for a new trial, and boom, you'll be out maybe, you know, another year or two, but certainly to serve out that long sentence. But what happens is with a plea deal, plea deals you, you can't really appeal because you've agreed to a certain sentence. You can appeal it for some small things or some very discreet actions like ineffective assistance of counsel. Or, you know, you might be able to plea... Um, you might be able to appeal a sentence if it was given harsher than the plea deal. But other than that, you're really hemmed up by that plea deal, and that's what makes this so dangerous. Right, and we've also turned over a lot of power to the prosecution. Judges are supposed to set the number of years someone should be sentenced to. But having these mandatory minimum has just added another playing card to the prosecu prosecution's deck. So now, whenever they have a defendant who's accused of a crime, they can almost be bullied into pleading out. And that's problematic on multiple fronts, because now we have these prosecutors that have this power that could be unchecked. And then we've taken power away from judges, and we've now intimidated some of our defendants into copying to things they did not do. Yeah, and as we know, th this really affects people of lower socio socioeconomic status. So you don't really want to gamble with, you know, an extra 30-year sentence with this team. It's not like you have a dream team and you hired the best lawyers and attorneys. Yeah. You know, you're just gambling. And I think a lot of these defendants, I worked in the public defender's office, a lot of times they think that the defense is colluding with the prosecution because they're all provided by the state. And so, you know, it's such an unfortunate situation that someone would plead guilty and get 10 years to avoid 40 when they didn't do the crime at all. Certainly. So it's something we hope they, um, they repeal. It looks like this election people have talked about um, repealing these um, things. And I know that in Louisiana there's a push to make it only really, to make that law not refer to nonviolent drug offenses. Correct. The Louisiana 
I think it's a representative reform organization, is looking to strike drug offenses and other minor crimes from this enhanced sentencing. My only critique of that is, is if we could be more specific about drug offenses, and this may be more laid out, but I don't think drug dealers should be included in striking you know, striking out drug offenses. Yeah. I think it should be limited to possession and possession of small amounts. Possession where it's... non-violent, yeah. Yeah, non-violent crimes, petty thefts, i.e. stealing sticker bars, snicker yeah. bars from yeah. a convenience store. I think that should be included. I think it's time to narrow that law a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so unfortunate. And the it's affecting people today, and they cannot be helped. You know, you right. plea, you're, you're stuck. And it affects people other than defendants in this case because this is taxpayer dollars here to lock up a man who was convicted of having marijuana that amounted to two cigarette buds. He was locked up for 13 years. And one year of housing a prisoner in Louisiana is 20000 a year. And if we add that all together, 20,000 times 13 years, that's $260,000. That's $130,000 per weed cigarette that he had in his hand. So this and, is taxpayer dollars at work. And, and right now, I believe they're spending $663 million um, to house these people, 44 uh, of their, crim of their um, criminal population, 44.3% of which are nonviolent drug offenders. And literally, Louisiana has a $943 million budget deficit. So they're, they're, they're losing money everywhere, and they're kind of housing the wrong people. Right. And so. you would think, hey, this is the cost of keeping crime down. Like, we have to keep people safe. This is important. But there has been no evidence that these enhanced sentencing have led to less crime in Louisiana. So what are we doing here? I'm seeing all I see is diminished returns. Yeah, I agree. And so uh, hopefully it's something they're able to, to roll back. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, Thanks for having that, me. That was a quick one. Yeah. Um, you guys, please download us on iTunes. Uh, give us five stars. Uh, please tweet us, comment. You know, we'd love to hear back from you. Uh, my name is Shaka Smith. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Shaka Strong. And I'm Shannon Myricks. You can find me on Twitter at Shannon Myricks. Thank you guys. Have a good evening. <laughs> good day. From executives Kevin Undergaro, Dario Kristen, Tiana Hobson, and the entire BHL staff, we would like to thank you for supporting Black Hollywood Live, the first online broadcast network dedicated to African American entertainment. For questions and comments, contact us. Info at BlackHollywoodLive.com. Like us on Facebook, tweet us, or Instagram us at BHL Online. And I am the official voice of Black Hollywood Live, Scipio. Instagram us at KingXOBay. Thanks for tuning in. Hollywood Redefined. The views expressed here are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals.